It's the final mailbag of the off season. We are just six days away from opening day, but you still got some great questions as you have all off season, including questions about Jared Kelnick, the bullpen, bullpen, and what's the point of spring training? What should we really take away from it? I'll answer those questions and many more on today's mailbag episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on social media at Shortstop Ball. Also, make sure you check out my written work over at BravesToday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on social media at Locked On underscore Braves, where you can submit questions just like fans did on today's episode to be answered in our mailbag podcast. If you're new, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. We're just a little over 300 subscribers away from getting to 10K. We are less than a week away from opening day. That was our goal. It's going to take a big effort to get there, but I do appreciate all support for helping us get this close, and we will eventually get there. Uh, we'll ho- Hopefully, it'll be by opening day. Either way, you have been Tremendous in supporting me here at Lockdown Braves, whether on YouTube, listening on the audio format, joining me here live in the podcast all off season long. I see new Turbo in here, Noah S., Joseph Greenwell, Michael Ritchie, Rich Lechman, Brennan Gandy, Jeffrey Humphreys, Chuck McMillan, Leland Hurt, all in here with me right now. No others will be joining throughout the night. I was a little late sending out the uh, sending out the link for this mailbag podcast. I see our Guinness joining. I know you've been here just about every. Uh, podcast this off season, so thank you so much for that. It's been a fun off season. Once we get to the regular season, I won't do as many of these live, and the mailbag episode uh, will still remain on Friday. But we just won't record as many of these live. But I do enjoy doing that with you during the off season and get to read some of the comments and converse with you a little bit more. It is Friday though. It's the favorite day of the week. I know it is for me. My favorite podcast of the week. I know it is for some of you out there as well. Um, like Leland, who says it's his favorite podcast of the week. So I'm excited to get into these questions. You have done an amazing job. You always do. Uh, Every week I send out the tweet asking for questions, and I'm thinking there's no way that they still have any interesting or intriguing questions left, and you still do every single week. So thank you so much for sending those in. That's what makes this episode each week so special is that you get to be a part of it, and you ask me really, really interesting questions, including this one from Leland, who I know is in here just about every night with me live on the podcast. Leland Hurt says, just curious, what's the point of having spring training if when somebody is performing well, everyone just says, well, it's spring training. We need to see them in real games for a month or two. So the way I approach spring training and how I evaluate performance is if they're a veteran, I really, really don't even look at what they're doing in spring training. For instance, and I tweeted this out the other day on my social media account at Shortstop Ball, I haven't even looked at the stats for the regulars this year. Really the only player I've looked at stats for are Forrest Wall and Jared Kelnick. I hadn't even glanced at the spring training stats for you know, Michael Harris, Ron Acuna, Matt Olson, Austin Riley. I hadn't even, I don't care. Those guys are going to be on the roster. It does not matter at all what they do in spring training. They are just getting their work in. And that's all that really matters. If they stay healthy and get their work in, you look at the numbers right now. Austin Riley is 726 OPS. That's okay. Ozzy Albee, 670 OPS. Uh, Sean Murphy, 740. That's okay. Matt Olson, a 596 OPS. That's dreadful, dreadful. Acuna, 704. Am I worried about any of those guys? Am I worried about Acuna being more of a 700 OPS player than a 900 OPS player? No, not at all. Am I worried about Matt Olson regressing so much that he has an OPS below 600? No, not at all. So the way I approach spring training is I don't even bother to look at the numbers for guys that I know are going to be on the team. I'll I'll say this, though. I was excited about Michael Harris coming into 2024. He's had a great spring training. And I'll say that kind of gives me just a little bit more excitement about him going into the year. But even so, his 326 average, 941 OPS, 
in the end, it means nothing. I do think he's going to have a big year, and maybe this is just a the start of that. But in hindsight, or looking back, it just it doesn't mean anything for these regulars. The only time you should really pay attention to spring training stats are for guys who are battling for position spots, or somebody like Jared Kelnick, who the Braves made a move for. You know, kind of gave him the left field job, but it was something that he still was going to have to earn. And that's really what you're looking at. I go back to last spring training too. Marcelo Zuna, you know, didn't look great. Obviously, didn't look great going into April, but you heard Brian Snicker say several times that he was really impressed with what he saw from Ozuna in spring training. And he stuck with him because he believed what he saw in spring training, even when the results weren't there. So another thing really to keep in mind for us as fans, we don't get to see all the work and we don't get to see all these games on TV to see what hitters are are working on, the the swings that they're make they're they're making or taking. We don't get to see all that like coaches do who are there every single day or even some of the media members who are there every single day. You know, in the regular season we can see every single at bat and we can break down, you know, the stats and the, the stat cast data as to how they're impacting the baseball. You don't get that in spring training, but there are guys working on things. There are, it's also sporadic at bats. You're playing every other day, which as we know with this Braves team, it's not something that they love to do to have the off days, play a day, then an off day. It's not conducive to their routine and their nature of playing every day. So again, for spring training, I don't even bother to look at guys who you know are established are going to be in the lineup or in the rotation. Like I've looked at spring at Spencer Strider's spring training stats just because they are absurd, but it doesn't mean anything. If he doesn't follow that up in the regular season, and you know, I think he can, maybe not the 0.00 ERA part, but I think he's capable of being a dominant pitcher just like he has in spring training. I focus on the forest walls. I, I focus on the not even really the David Fletcher's and Luis Guillorme's guys who have been there, done that. You kind of know what to expect from them. I look at the, the, the rookies, the, the Nacho Alvarez of the world, the Drake Baldwin's, how do they look? Do they look overmatched when they're getting opportunities against big league pitching? So it's really a player by player case when you're talking about spring training and who is actually out there to prove something, who is trying to win a job, who is trying to impress coaches for the upcoming season if they're needed. And that's really how you have to approach it as a fan. So sorry that got a little long-winded there. Probably should have done that before spring training, but thank you, Leland, for the question. Next one comes in from Braves 2021 World Series Champs. He says, do you have any particular series circled in the first two months that you would want to go to if you could? So I obviously, or I honestly haven't looked that far ahead. I'm still waiting to get my opening day tickets. I assume you were just talking about games at home um, and obviously you want to be at the home opener on April 5th against the Diamondbacks. I mean, they are the defending national league champion. So I think that's going to be a pretty interesting series. And then you got the Mets at home, um, but you look just a couple of series down and you're getting the Texas Rangers at home, April 19th through 21st. So, I mean, in the first couple of weeks of the season, you're getting the two teams from last year's world series at home. So I think that's definitely two series right there that you have to circle. Again, if we're just talking about the home slate, getting the Diamondbacks and the Dodger and the Diamondbacks and the Rangers in the first month at home, those are going to be some pretty fun series to watch in the early going and two that I would go to if I could, especially why Langford's going to be there for the Rangers now. I think that's going to be a really fun series to watch. Next question from Cass Buckeyes. If there's one addition or change you could make the truest park or the battery, what would it be? So this is a great question. Let me know your suggestions down in the comment section below. As somebody who is a who is a parent with young kids, and maybe they have this around there and I just haven't seen it, I'd like to see more kid-friendly stuff out in the battery area. I know that area is more for you know adults and people who are, who are consuming adult beverages before and after games. And I, I get that it's more of an adult hangout type of location, but I'd like to see more stuff for the kids. And again, maybe it's there and I just haven't found it, but uh, you know, like a, a, maybe an arcade or something. Um, I, I think it, for me as a parent of young kids right now, that's something that I would like to see is something more 
family or oriented and something more for the kids, I think would be really, really fun. All right. We got a lot more questions to get into. That was just the first three of, I believe, 15 that we had submitted in. We'll get to the rest of those questions here next. Do you love getting money back on the things that you buy? Of course you do. What kind of question is that? And you can do so with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app that gives you the most cash back every time you shop on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies to toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns $145 per year. That can cover the cost of an entire shopping trip, not for my wife. Buy that flight you've been eyeing, that game you're dying to go to. I need those for opening day tickets right now because they are super expensive. Or the fancy dinner you've been craving. Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, just add your offers in the app, upload your receipt, and you get a real cash that you can cash out to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Join the over 50 million savers and earn cash back every time you shop from over 2,700 brands and retailers, including Lowe's, Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code locked on MLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use code locked on MLB. That's I B O T T A in the Google Play or App Store and use code locked on MLB. Say goodbye to busted brackets because of Auburn. I mean, because of FanDuel, which lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on an upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Right now, March Madness obviously is going on. My Auburn Tigers, I watched the second half of the game, and I wish that I wouldn't have, and now I can fully turn my attention to baseball. That was the only part of March Madness that I had any interest in, and they went ahead and took care of that for me so that I can get back to watching some good college baseball. But if you're still into March Madness, you can get in on the action over at FanDuel.com slash locked on. But if you are like me and you've turned the page and you're ready for Major League Baseball, they have all of the lines over there as well for the upcoming season, including some team-specific specials that are really fun, including some on Ron Acuna Jr., Spencer Strider. Again, even if you, you don't bet and maybe you're like, oh, Tani's interpreter and you just need a break, it's really fun to go over and look at some of the lines that they have as well for your Braves over at locked on or over at fanduel.com slash locked on. But if you are like Ippy, and you have some gambling issues, make sure you visit FanDuel.com slash play safe for tools and resources to help you stay in control of the way you play. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. As you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today. Baseball fans, mark your calendars for March 20th at 7 uh, that has already happened, so you can forget that. But make sure that you subscribe to Locked On Sports today on YouTube, or you can get it on the Amazon Fire TV channels app and get a lot of great coverage from us here at Locked On 24-7. Next Monday, I'm going to tell you which prospect will be ranked number one in the system at the end of 2024. And I don't think it'll be A.J. smith Shaver. I don't think it'll be Hurston Waldrop, but I'm going to tell you who I think it will be on Monday's podcast as we begin opening day week. So looking forward to the podcast we got coming up for you next week. Let's jump back into the list of questions here. Another one from Cavs Buckeyes who says, I, wasn't, I wouldn't call it a weakness because it's not a flaw to have great players, but could the Braves have an advantage over the Dodgers in a short series, given all the lefties in their lineup now that the Braves have sale to go with Freed and have added Bummer, Kerr, and Matzik? So, Short answer is yes. I mean, I, I think that was very specific from Alex Anthopoulos this offseason. He had targeted a lot of lefties. And I think part of it is because A.J. Minter could be gone next year. You don't really know what you're getting from Matzik. And you don't know really what lefties. You didn't know what you're going to get from Dylan Lee either coming back off a, a struggling 2023 with injuries. So you went out and got a bummer. You got a Ray Kerr. 
Uh, you, you got others in there as well. And I think it was also because of the Phillies. The Phillies have some good lefties in Schwarber and Harper at the top of their lineup that you have to deal with. The Dodgers obviously have some good lefties up and down their lineup as well. So I think that was a very strategic move by Alex Anthopoulos in the offseason to go out and target some lefties, not just to give some insurance for the future, but also to help deal with the Dodgers and the Phillies. Next question from Large Lars says, what is the story on Ray Kerr? We traded for him and sent him down early. Is he injured? And if he's healthy, how's he looking? Um, he did get some appearances in spring training. He was never somebody that was going to come over and make this roster. He, I think even if he pitched really well in spring, tw- spring, spring training, um, he is somebody who, again, gives you that depth of the left-handed variety for the future. He's under team control for a while. He has a minor league option left. So I never thought he was somebody that was going to come over and have a spot in this bullpen unless, you know, Matzik needed more time. Dylan Lee just needed more time and and still looked kind of rusty. It was going to take some other guys just really not being there for Ray Kerr to get a shot on the roster. Um, But they brought him over again for insurance for the future uh, and just to give you some more left-handed depth as well. But again, he did pitch a couple of games in spring training. I don't remember exactly what the results were. It looks like four and two thirds innings, eight strikeouts in spring training. So that's you know pretty solid. Uh, did give up several runs as well. But uh, four and two thirds innings, seven hits, not great. Three earned runs, but just one walk and eight strikeouts. So he's somebody we likely could see this year. And like I said, either a Matzik Falls or, or a mentor. Um, you got four lefties already in your bullpen, so you're not going to carry a fifth one. Uh, but Ray Kerr, when that move happened, it was more for the future. Caden Hurd says, with Kelnick looking better the past few at-bats, could we potentially see 20-plus homers, or is that too much of a fever dream? Uh, well, I was going to say I don't think so, but if it is a true platoon, I think that does limit his ability to reach that 20 threshold. Um, I said when the Braves traded for him, I think he has 20-20 upside and potential. But that's more of him being an everyday player. Sounds like he might not be that. But even Eddie Rosario last year, he got 478 at-bats, 516 plate appearances, and he hit 21 home runs. So it is certainly possible for Jared Kelnick. I do think he he gets to 20 home runs at some point in his career. So I don't think that's crazy at all. I think that's what the Braves were hoping for when they got him, that he'd be a 20-plus home run bat, a 20-plus stolen base um, runner as well. So I don't think that is without possibility. Cass Buckeyes back in here says, when do you think AA takes a hitter in the first round of the draft? If ever also we get Drew Burris to tell, can we get Drew Burris to tell teams he'll only sign with the Braves in 2026? So, I mean, it's, it's really hard to imagine Alex Anthopoulos and it's not just him. It's obviously, you know, the scouts and everybody in that draft room, but it's hard to see them taking something other than uh, a pitcher in the first round, just because we don't see it. Haven't seen it very much, but I think he would do it, especially as the Braves continue to pick towards the back half of the first round. I think at some point you're going to see them take a, a high school hitter and have to develop them. It's just, it's so, so risky. And you know, the college bats that are going to be available around that point are are fringe. You know, fringe, not just all-star level talents usually. I mean, sometimes the Mike Trouts fall into the, the 1921 range or, or whatever it was that he fell to, but he was a high school player, so that nullifies what I just said. But typically, the college bats that are going to be there, there's question marks on if they're even going to be everyday players because all the great college hitters, they're going to go in the first 15 picks and typically all the the best college hitters as well so if you're going to take a hitter at the back half of the first round it's usually going to be a high school bat that got pushed down because of signability and those are just just so risky and it's obviously even more risky to take a high school a high school pitcher like the Braves did with a J.R. Ritchie and an Owen Murphy not too long ago the safest bet there is the college arm which the Braves have done a lot in Alex Anthopoulos' tenure, but I think it'll happen, but I think it's going to take maybe a Drew Burris, maybe a Georgia kid who gets pushed down because he really wants to 
play for the Braves and pray that he plays for the Braves. Um, but yeah, you just, it's hard to imagine it happening. It's one of those things kind of like with the payroll. I'll believe it when I see it, but they've had a lot of success. And I think they need to continue to take arms. Arms are always going to be very valuable in major league baseball. You know, you're, you're hoping to get bring in five and that one of them makes it healthy to the big leagues and sticks in a rotation. It's just really the success rate right now with, with pitchers. So they're going to continue to draft them and draft many of them, hope to develop them, and hope that one of them, at least one of them, hits. Caden Hurd also asks, who do you think could be called up and make the most impact between A.J. smith Shaver or Waldrop, whether it be in the pin or rotation, to start? I think it's going to be a, a tell of two halves for both guys. I think A.J. smith Shaver is going to get an opportunity within the first month or two of the year to come up, get a chance to prove himself and stick in the rotation. So I think the first half of the season, it's going to be AJ Smith Shavers. I think the second half of the season, it's going to be Hurston Waldrop's. I think, I think both these guys could make an impact, but I think AJ Smith Shavers is going to get his chance in the first half and maybe he holds on to it. But even if he, whether he does or doesn't, I think the second half of the season, we're going to see Waldrop come up in some capacity. I think it will be as a starter come postseason time. I mean, could you imagine having both of those guys coming out of the bullpen with the stuff that they have? I think those could be real big weapons in the bullpen come postseason time. Cass Buckeyes kind of follows up on that question, says you can't pick A.J. smith Shaver or Waldrop. What rookie eligible player produces the most war this season? Could Lara come up in a bullpen role a la, a la Strider? Um, I mean, that would be a long way to that'd be a long way to go for Lara because I think he's going to go back to high A to start the year. He's a really young guy. I mean, I could see it just because it would be in a bullpen capacity. It could be another way to kind of limit his his workload. I think Waldrop and AJ Smith Shaver are going to get the opportunity ahead of him to do that. Eh. I'm going to kind of take what I think is an easy route here. And I'm going to say Dazel Hernandez because he still qualifies as a rookie. And I think he could be up very, very soon in the bullpen. Maybe he gets to one war um, this year. That's a pretty high, high ceiling for a reliever. So probably not that, but I think he has a chance to come up and log, log big innings for the Braves this year. Drake Baldwin is another one kind of, if something were to happen to, to Travis Darno, I think Drake Baldwin could be, that next man up uh, Braves might not want to do that because they might want him to get everyday reps at triple a. Uh, but I think he could be another kind of dark horse rookie uh, player to get some, get some at bats and, and rack up uh, some stats as well. All right, next we'll get into some more questions. We still have more to go through on today's podcast, including um, where is Ken Giles, some on international signings pl uh, players as well, and some MLB The Show content. I'll answer all those questions here and next. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or March Madness, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us here at Locked On and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all of the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep you up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, whether that be March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots of lots more. And when you get into the dog days of summer, maybe you need to take a little bit of a break from the baseball highlights. They also have great channels for news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos that you can check out on the Fire TV channel. So do just that. Check out the Fire TV channels today on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. They've been a great access for me and my wife to learn more visit amazon.com slash locked on fire tv all right got 
A couple more questions to get to here. Uh, some really good ones as well that I'm excited to, to discuss. Chuck McMillan says, with the verbal agreement of Alfredo Sena to sign with us in 2027, how is that different than what Cavallella did to get fired back in the day? Have the rules changed or what is the threshold we are tiptoeing around? So a loaded question. Um, I've talked about the international signing situation on here before. I think it is sketchy at best. Uh, it makes me uncomfortable to even talk about it. Um, the fact that you have scouts over there making deals with 12 year olds. Again, that, that feels sketchy at best. It needs to be adjusted. There needs to be some rules made. In my opinion, there needs to be an international draft. That said, it's not what Manfred was, is doing. I'm, I'm going to read this verbatim from a, an article that I found going back to when Manfred was suspended. Manfred um, said MLB, or sorry, not when Manfred was suspended. Wouldn't that be something? Back when Capolello was suspended, Manfred said MLB's investigation determined the Braves funneled extra signing bonus money to five players in 2015 to 16 by giving the funds first to another player considered a foreign professional under baseball's rules and having the money redistributed to the other five. If the money had been counted for the other five, the Braves would have exceeded their pool by more than 5% and been restricted to signing bonuses of 300,000 or under for international amateurs through June 15, 2019. So it's different. What's, what's done now basically is that handshake deals are made with these kids when when they're 12 and 13 years old. I have nephews that are 12 and 13 years old. I cannot imagine them making life decisions like that. But that's what the process is right now, and and that's the acceptable process. What Cavallella was doing was basically filtering in money to skirt the allotted pool money that they have, which is not, which was not legal. Um, now my understanding is that a lot of teams were doing that and Razor made example of whatever you want to say. It was, it was bad. I mean, as, as cringe as the international signing process is right now, in my opinion, that is just next level cringe, but, um, either way it, it is different than what Capoella was doing. Michael Vandenberg says, any word on Ken Giles would like to see if he gets some run rather than Steven. So uh, this one surprises me. As well, I, you know, Ken Giles looked really good uh, early in spring training. You know, was the talk of spring training there for a little bit, and then he got he got reassigned really early on, and then we never heard from him again. He pitched three innings this spring, allowed just one hit. He did he did walk three batters, but struck out five. I thought he had a real chance to make the bullpen, and I still think he probably should have made the bullpen, probably over Dylan Lee. I haven't heard anything since then. I'm trying to look real quickly to see when his last spring training outing was. Uh, March 7th is his last spring training outing. Like I said, he got reassigned not long after that. He obviously could still be throwing uh, in, in minor league games and all of that. But yeah, that one's a bit of a head scratcher because he looked really good. I thought he was going to make the bullpen and then we just haven't heard from him since March 7th. So uh, that one, I don't know, but I would imagine we see him or Daisel Hernandez here pretty quickly. Impat0915 says, uh, hey, Jake, I loved all the offseason coverage. Can you project your stat line for Chris Sale, given that he makes at least 30 starts this year? If he makes 30 starts this year, I'm going to say 160 innings, 14 wins. Just because the Braves offense is that good, he's going to he's going to get some added wins. 3.6 ERA, 190 strikeouts. I don't know that he gets to 200, but I think he'll push it. So uh, 360 ERA, 14 wins, 190 strikeouts is what I would project for Chris Sale. He's still really, really good. I mean, I, I think he can be that guy. Would a 3.8 ERA surprise me? No. Would a 4.5 ERA surprise me? Yes. I think he's most likely going to be somewhere in between 3.6 and 4-2 ERA-wise. I kind of cap the innings at 160 because I think there'll just be games where the Braves only let him go five, six in innings, even if he has more in the tank. Um, so I think they'll try to limit his workload that way. 
And he's still a great strikeout pitcher. He's still a nerdy, nearly 30% strikeout rate type of pitcher. Uh, Impat also says, I know you're an avid MLB The Show player. Just how good are you and what difficulty do you play on? I'm finding it very tough to hit consistently on this year's game. Can you tell us what mode you play and how difficult or easy the game is for you? Um, I don't know. that I'm not I'm not that good. I, I mean, on ranked, when I play ranked, I usually can make World Series. If I actually go for it, I usually don't have the time for that grind. I generally just go in and I play events or I play some BR. I just don't have the time to to grind the ranked seasons and and all the offline stuff like that. Um, so I mean, I'd say I'm I'd say I'm a good player. I wouldn't say I'm a great player. I am having trouble pitching this year. Uh, pitching's been really tough. Offense has just been ridiculous. Uh, so I'm kind of the opposite of you. But uh, yeah, I'd say I'm a pretty good player. Um, I generally play all my games on all-star because like I said, I generally play events in BR for the most part, BR being battle Royale. If you're not familiar with the game, with the game. So that's typically how I enjoy MLB the show. You ever see me on there? My team name is shortstop ball. So hit me up. Let me know. Uh, last question here from Leland Hurt says, do you think the Braves would try to bring back Soroka if he is having a good season? Will Braves attempt to retain Max later in season and sign him for a long-term contract provided he is having a great season? I mean, if Soroka's having a great year and it all lines up, I think they would bring him back. I don't think it's something that they're going to just go out and target him. And obviously the White Sox would have to, the Braves would have to have something that the White Sox want to trade Soroka. What I, something I don't understand, and maybe one of you can let me know in the comment section below. If the Braves extend Max Free during the season, does that count towards their luxury tax payroll for 2024? I think it does which is why I kind of think an extension can't happen until after the year, if it's going to happen. I don't think it will, but I think it would have to happen after the season. All right, that's all the questions that were submitted. Thank you so much for submitting all those. I didn't get to yours. I do apologize, um, but some more great, great questions. Some quick news items. Wyatt Lankford, Jackson Churio will start the year in the big league. Some of the top prospects for the Rangers and Brewers respectively, but Jackson Holiday will not for the Orioles, which is a bit of a head scratcher. And the countdown to opening day, we are six days away. And obviously that is for the man, Bobby Cox. Got a poster of him right up over here on my wall. All the prayers and everything for Bobby Cox. Haven't heard much of him uh, lately there, but obviously love Bobby Cox. He was, you know, the 90s. He, he was part of leading that, that 90s Braves team that was so, so good. Have a lot of respect for Bobby Cox and him and his managerial career. All right, that will do it for this episode. Thanks so much to Matthew, Jeffrey, Leland, Argenis, Scooter Puff in here. Docs Cards joined as well. McGee, Battle for Truth. Thanks for jump, jumping in here with me and hanging out till the end of this podcast. Next week is opening day week here on the podcast. Got a lot of great coverage coming your way. So make sure that you are subscribed to Locked on Braves on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. And we will talk to you next time.